Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to everyone that's here in, uh, in person and online. I tried to put those two words together and it just don't work. So we're just thrilled. This weekend has been beautiful. If you haven't been outside, get outside, enjoy the day today. It's going to be another beautiful day out there. Um, the announcements for this week is all that's coming up is uh, we've got our group. <laughs> What's that? I'm just running out of words. Uh, we've got some group time together of fellowship and prayer. And we encourage you to come out and join us. We'll have a small devotional. And we'll spend a lot of time in prayer because that's just something that we really need right now with the way things are in the world. Uh, people needing it. Mark was just telling about me about one of the people on our prayer list who had surgery on Thursday. We've got more stuff for people coming up this week in surgery and procedures. So it's just a, a great time for everyone to come together and to lift those folks up in prayer. And also to give praise to God for all the miracles that he has done in our lives. So we want to give him thanks for that. And two weeks now, we will have the June Orange Track Racing. So that's coming up real quick. Mark's eyes got real big. He's like, oh. So we're looking forward to that. Um, one thing we do want to give praise for is Mark uh, was out of town for a couple of weeks and the good Lord brought him back safely. Thank you, Lori, for take, going down there and helping him get back. That had to make that drive to Florida much, much easier uh, with the two of you as, as opposed to just the one. Well, this morning our call to worship is going to come from Romans and it comes right out of chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. This is what Paul wrote. He says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, last night, Diane and I uh, watched a movie we've been looking forward to watching for a very long time. It was The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. And this movie was interesting. To say the least, the very first part was so cringeworthy, I almost had her turn it off. Because what we saw was someone who was pretending to have faith. And as he was pretending to have faith, he was spouting all this Christianese words that people that he heard in the church. And boy, he got out of his iPhone and he was Googling what he needed to say and how he needed to say it how he needed to dress. But through the course of the movie, he came to know God. And without really destroying the movie for anybody, at the very end, he openly declares that God is the Lord of his life. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is, is how we declare our faith in God and what that truly means for us. And we're going to have some scripture today that, that really dives into that. And so, Father, we just look forward to hearing what you have for us today. We look forward to the message that you've provided for us today, Father. How we can declare your name, how we can mean it, as Paul talks about it here, that we have to openly declare and believe it in our heart that you are God and that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, Father. Father, let us hear it. Father, let us put a blessing upon the worship team as they sing this morning. And let the message through those words, through the words of the songs, reach us as well. Let them bring us to a place where we can hear exactly what you need us to hear today. Father, you are an amazing God. You do so much for us. Father, we just want this to be a blessing to you. We want to, to lift up and show you how much we love you because we already know how much you love us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. It is good. It's always a good thing to be here to worship the Lord together. It's good to have a bass player back again. <laughs>
yesterday we had the privilege of going and, and listening to some friends of mine play outside at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church. They're getting ready for the, for the festival season where they go around and do uh, gospel music at festivals. What a talented group of people in it. It just reminded me how blessed we are uh, that, that uh, God gave us the ability to get together and sing and do music together, worship together in that unique and wonderful way. Thank you. 
we should take them. Now you can hear me. Mm -hmm. I forgot it the first time around. Father, thank you for this day. This day that you have made, Father. As we rejoice in it, Father, as we hear your message this morning, Father, let it resound with us. Let it sink in with us, Father. As we've talked about in the last week, Father, let us surrender it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today, I, I looked at the title today, and it's just like, you declare. The first thing that popped in my head is, what do you declare each day? And what do others see you declaring each day? Are you declaring your faith by your actions? And your words. Are you doing it in public and in private? Because God sees both. <laughs> Even though everyone might not see the in private stuff, God sees both. So, what are you declaring? See, it might be in private, I might be declaring that I have this unhealthy love of chocolate. <laughs> That's where the 100 grand bars have been disappearing, too. <laughs> Or the Reese's peanut butter cups that we probably shouldn't be buying. Those are the type of things. What are we declaring by what we say and what we do? When we get upset with someone, what are we declaring? When we speak harshly to them, what are we declaring? But when we turn around and forgive them or speak kindly to them, what are we declaring? So that's what I want you to think about today as we talk about declaring our faith and who Jesus is. Now our first scripture this morning is going to come from Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 18. And it's really in this passage that Peter, he just, he declares Jesus to be the Messiah and the Son of the living God. So listen to what uh, it says here, starting with verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus was just declared by Peter, the son of of the living God, the Messiah. Now, then Jesus' response, there's some differing opinions on that, as far as uh, who Jesus was. Right? So, uh, going back to the very beginning here, they said John the Baptist, which we all know that's impossible because Jesus, John baptized Jesus. But some of the others may not have known that. And then, of course, Elijah and Jeremiah and some of the other prophets. Because, like we talked about last week, he proved him out to be from God because he was doing miracles. And that was a sign to the people that a person was sent by God. And then when he says you in verse 15, but who do you say I am? He's not just talking to one person. He's talking not just to the disciples, but he, I really think he's talking to all of us. Who do we say that Jesus is? And Peter just simply answers for all of us when he says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, here's the thing. If we drop back a couple of chapters, in, first, in chapter 14 in Matthew 33, they all declared, and they said this, you really are the Son of God. Now, this goes back to, uh, 
Envision this where Peter is in the boat and storming out, and Jesus is walking to him, and they all get a little freaked out by it. And then Peter says, if, if you really are, tell me to get out of the water and come to you. And so Peter gets out, and, what, and he starts walking on the water. And that's got to be like, you know, goosebumps type stuff, right? And then all of a sudden, what happens? The same thing that happens to us in the world. This world. Mm -hmm. And he started to sink. And Jesus reached down and he pulls him up and he gets him into the boat. And then he puts him to, he calms the storm. And that's where they, that's where this comes from, where they say, you really are the son of God. They, they are starting to understand his teaching, starting to believe what's going on. That's not the only time we hear that, though. And it's not just from the disciples that we hear that. Fast forward to his crucifixion. And after his death, the scriptures say this, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion said, this man truly was the son of God. And see, in, their, in our finite mind, Looking at him, they see him dead, so they're going to use was. But we know better today. He is the Son of God. And it is in this declaration that Jesus will build his church. Now, going back to the Peter's confession and being representative of the apostles or of the people, or Jesus, who is the rock that Jesus is talking about that he will build his church? And we got to look at scripture to kind of come up with that because it's, it's not real clear. But if we look at Ephesians 2, 21, it says, We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. So think of that. We are becoming the foundation of the church. And in Revelations 21, 14, it says, The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we become the foundation of the church. And without a foundation, what happens? A building crumbles and it falls. So without a foundation, the church doesn't continue on. That's why it's so important. That's why Mark and I are so uh, adamant about our teachings coming right from here. They have to be biblically based. They have to be Jesus-centric. So how do you know Jesus? The disciples knew him because they walked with him. The Roman soldiers got to know him a little bit as they mocked him and killed him. How do you know Jesus? Is it by word of mouth? Did somebody tell you about Jesus? Did you grow up in the church and you heard about Jesus pretty much all your life? Or did it, is it something that came later? Did you read about him? Quite honestly, reputation even comes into that. Think of, of Palm Sunday. We just had Palm Sunday not, s several weeks ago. And we talked about the parade, and he's coming in, and everybody waving the palm branches or throwing their coats on the ground for the, the colt to walk across. A lot of those people there were because, there because of his reputation. So they knew him, but they didn't know him. And, and you've heard Mark and I say that a lot. There's a difference between knowing who Jesus is and knowing him. So basically what that means is second-hand faith is not enough. You can't declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior if your faith is second-hand. Now people, people are satisfied that Jesus was good, he was moral, he was a do-gooder who taught how to serve, live, and know God. Other religions even admit to that. The Jews admit that he was a good man. Muslims agree that Jesus was a good man. But that's just knowing who he was, not actually knowing him. So you see, it's not enough. We, we need to place him on the throne of our whole heart and our whole life. In Acts 10 through 11, we hear about a Roman soldier. His name is Cornelius. And he found out that just knowing who Jesus was 
was not enough. I'm going to read to you from Acts 10 through 11. And we're going to talk about it a little bit as we go. Because this is important. Because this is where we find out that Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He came for all of us. So in chapter 10, it starts off saying this. In Caesarea, there was, lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Then one afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. Can you imagine? Just be like, whoa. And he said, what is it, sir? And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Java and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, who lives near the seashore. And as soon as the angel disappeared, Cornelius called two of his household servants and did a devout soldier and one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Java. He didn't hesitate. He had been praying, and he had been given the point. He was doing none of this out of, out of ambition for himself. He wasn't seeking to have this be something where, oh, look at me and look what I did. We've talked about this over the past several weeks where you know, the Jewish uh, leaders would stand in the corner in their big robes. They wanted to hear everybody to hear what they were saying and know who they were and call them by their title because that was what was important to them, not their actual faith. See, here's the thing, when he goes to, when they go to meet Peter, Peter also has a vision. And so, the next day as Cornelius' his messengers were here in the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry, but while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open. And something like a large sheet let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Can you imagine his thoughts? Uh, no, Lord. Those unclean, no, can't eat that. But God is teaching him something here. Peter had, and after saying no, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But here, the voice declared, Spoke again, says, do not call something unclean that God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, and then the sheet was pulled, suddenly pulled up to heaven. And Peter was perplexed. He did. Could you imagine? He was like, um, okay, what does this mean? And it's not like he had Daniel around him, where Daniel could just come and interpret the dream like Daniel had done for Pharaoh, right? So... At that very point, that's when the men from Cornelius' home had appeared. And they stood at the gate and they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. And while Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So he's not actually giving him an answer to his his question about what does this mean, he's going to show him what it means over the next several verses as he talks about this, as we read about this. So Peter went down and said, I am the man you are looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night, and the next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. Now, can you imagine if he's in his mind, he's going, um, okay, Lord, you're sending me to talk to a Gentile? How is that going to play out here, God? What, what is it that you really want me to do? And it's, it reminds me of that story of the guy who's on his way home, and, and God tells him to stop and buy milk, and he doesn't need 
listens and finds the milk, and so then he continues on home, and then God says, stop in front of this house. Take that milk up to me. All right, yeah, I'm not walking out to some stranger's house and asking if they want milk. But in the illustration, he goes up and he does just as God asks him what happens. The mother and the father are there and they're crying because they didn't have any milk for their baby. God answered their need. So God is answering Cornelius' need. And so it continued as nine. It says, they have arrived in Caesarea the following day. And Cornelius was waiting for them and he called together his relatives and close friends. He wanted everyone to hear this message. This is, this is why Mark and I are like, go out, invite somebody. Share you know, the posts on our, our social media. Invite people to hear the message that God has for you. And that's what Cornelius wanted to hear. He wanted all of his friends and all of his relatives to hear about God. And as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. Think about the letters that Paul wrote. He said this how many times when he was going to the different people. No, don't bother me. I'm not, I'm not a God. I'm not an angel. Stand up. I'm, I'm just like you. And so they talked together and they went inside where many others were assembled. And Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. None of us is beyond God's reach. None of us is beyond the grace that he has for us, his mercy and his forgiveness. And he continues, he says, so I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. And Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about this time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named, named Simon Peter. He's seeing the home of Simon, the tanner, who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we all are here, waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Cornelius knew that the message that Peter was giving was from there was no question in his mind. And it is in this time that the Gentiles will then hear the good news. And Peter says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he talks about how they, as the apostles, walked with him and taught and learned and saw the miracles. And they also saw him die on the cross, but yet they also saw him being raised from the dead. And they knew that he was the Son of God. And then he talks about the Great Commission. He says, he ordered us. He commanded us. And then we can drop in the, the end of Matthew where he says, go into all the world, teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that everyone would know him. And so it is while he is teaching, he is preaching them, that they all receive the Holy Spirit. We can all receive it. It's not just, again, for the Gentiles. But here's the thing. In chapter 11, and I'll have you guys go and read this after, you know, later today or tomorrow. But in chapter 11, here's the thing. Peter goes back and what happens? The other apostles are like, what did you do? They didn't understand why he had gone to the Gentiles. He went against the rules. He associated with the Gentiles. He, even, he went into their home. He shared a meal. He taught them. But then he had taken witnesses with him. And they were able to say yes. And they received the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly they all understood that it was for everyone. 
And see, this is the message that people, they lose in the Old Testament. God chose the Israelites as his chosen people. Not to be a country club or a, this little exclusive club that no one else could get into, but as the people that would go out into the whole world and share God. He, this was his group of people. This is, the, this is like our core here. You know, we, we preach and we teach it to you to prepare you to go out. We talked about that once tonight. Start praying about what can we do to go out that door Mark and I have been talking about this forever. We've got to get our whiteboard out and wipe it all off and start fresh and new because you know, a pandemic threw a whole wrench of things for us. But we need to go out that door. And, and Mark walked in this morning and he goes, uh, you know, farmer's market's kicking off here pretty soon. How can we use that as a way to reach people? What are other things that we can do to reach people? Because you know what? People aren't just going to organically walk in the door. People need to be invited in. And how can we do that in a way that's not pushy? In a way that won't push them away? Because you know what? Too many Christians out there, or self-professing Christians, push others away because of the things they do and the things they say. I, I, and I see and I know some of you may not be on social media, you don't care for social media on the much I'm on there because that's um, where you know, some of the ministry here is at. And I see someone post something. And you know the people that attack the worst, that attack their fellow Christians the worst, are often other Christians. Oh, you did that? Well, you're going to burn in hell for that. Oh, what, what happened to coming alongside someone and helping them? How many times have you heard someone going through something in their life and like a divorce and being shunned by the church? Or they did something wrong and now they're shunned by the church? Now, uh, I know a lot of us were part of a Mission of Hope for a number of years and they are ministry to people who are coming out of jail. Giving them a second chance. Because the church is a place of second chances, of third chances. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we can't go back and say, God has screwed up. Forgive me. The Bible says if we do that, then he will forgive us. And we'll be redeemed again. God's church is more than we think it is. The series has been about God, who's, about who God says you are. Week one, we talked about who are you. We talked about Mark talked about who we are in Christ, and we talked about being broken, and we talked about being chosen, and, and last week we talked about surrendering. It's through each of those things that we end up in this final message of the series on declaring who we are. And even in this, God is telling us who we are. I mean, this it's not a message that starts with A and goes to E, because there's no other Bible, but it's a it's this circle. Because as we learn who we are, and we get all the way to back to and surrender and declaring, that comes right back to who we are. And it's God just is in and of all of it. Listen to what Peter writes later. And this is going to be 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. Peter writes, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Think about last week. Remember what we talked about last week? We are talking about how um, the Pharisee came to see Jesus at night. But because he, 
he just coming to see Jesus, he was coming into the light. He was learning, he was growing from what he would hear from Jesus, and he would not ultimately, uh, we don't know where he ended up, like we talked about, but we do know that he was curious, he was asking questions. Peter continues, he says, once you have had once you had no identity as our people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, and now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as a temporary resident, as temporary residents of war. So he's telling us we're not to be living in this world because we're not of this world. We are, we are kingdom people. says, I warn you as temporary residents of foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. It's those worldly desires that can declare to others who you are. So let's declare differently. We need to be careful to live properly among our unbelieving neighbors. He says, then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. They're going to see through your actions who you truly are. We are called to be like Jesus. I mean, think of Lot. He wasn't perfect. Yet he feared God. He knew God. And what happened? He, God saved him from the, the disaster that he brought upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But in that, in that story, we also see what happens when we look away. Because what happened to his wife? She looked away, and she became a pillar of salt. We have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. We need, we need to be like Jesus. And Jesus was, and he continues to build his church. It's not Mark and I, it's not you all that builds this church. It's God living through us that builds his church. And Jesus, he started and he, he's continuing to build it and, and we need to make the same declaration that Peter did. If we go back to Matthew 16, 16, where we say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Old assumptions about the church that it was only for the Abrahamic Jewish people, that's thrown out the window. That I mean, we talked about, we just talked about that from Acts, when Peter went to go see Cornelius, and Cornelius and his family and his friends all became believers. And so like Cornelius, we are called out of the darkness and into the light. And I know Bruce wants to start singing right now. <laughs> we are the very building blocks that Jesus is going to use to build his church. He's laying the foundation with us, and he's building his church. And there's so many ways they can do that. I mean, we, sh we show movies every other month because there's a message in those. Those are things that we can use to help create a foundation. So if we think back to the last movie, that Overcomer movie that we saw, we had two hours or so to get to know the characters in this movie. Not a lot of time. There's got to have been a lot of complexities that we didn't know about or see. And, you know, we didn't know where they came from. We don't know what they went through getting to that point. And we all have our stories. And we all uh, have things that we're not proud of that we've done. And yet God lifts us up and he uses us. I mean, he used a murderer. He used a drunkard. He used, I mean, he used all kinds of people to spread his message. He can use all of us. We got to stop jumping to conclusions about others. That's easy to do. You hear somebody open their mouth, and instantly it's easy to jump to conclusions. You see how somebody's driving, it's instantly you jump to conclusions about the type of person that they are. But we don't truly know that. Think about uh, the, some of the people that you see. Oh, he's got tattoos. He can't be. He's probably in a biker gang or something. No. Some of us could be one of the most wonderful people in the world. 
Stop looking at what you physically see and get to know people like you've got to know Jesus. We need to declare who he is. Because we have to develop relationships. We developed a relationship with Jesus. We get to know who he is by going through these pages and reading about him. And it starts at the beginning and goes all the way to the end. We are all sinful and we all have reasons to be excluded from the kingdom that's talked about. But it, Peter's declaration that Jesus was the Son, the Son of God, that happened before he denied him. So there, see, here comes the Pope. Jesus den was denied by Peter before he makes this declaration. And he was forgiven. That's pretty great news. I know what my sins are. I know that's really good news. Peter's failure did not stop him from becoming a witness to the Jews, and it did not stop him from becoming a witness to the Gentiles. His faith was restored. His ministry exploded, and so can ours. We need to graciously share the good news of Christ's salvation with everyone. It goes back to, the, it goes back to our very foundation, prayer, care, and share. We need to be praying about people that we want to talk to and invite. We need to care for them. Show them, and then we will have earned the right to share with them. In the movie, Principal Brooks, she earned the right to share with Hannah. Over time, but she learned, earned that right. And she, like Peter, seized that divine appointment to share who Christ was with Hannah. And what happened in the movie? Hannah came to know Christ because of Olivia, the principal. And Thomas, he's a signpost pointing John to refreshment in his walk with Jesus and to an understanding of his identity in Christ. He, like Peter, spoke up and redirected someone's life. So he spoke up and his wife spoke up and they got Hannah redirected. She helped redirect her. He put away his, his selfish ambitions of, of being the basketball coach who was going to have the state championship team that year. And then everything fell apart, fell out from underneath of him. But yet, he declared, and, and I don't remember which week it was that it was talked about, but pretty much his wife um, had that come to Jesus chat with him. So it quit acting that way. I can think of a few come to Jesus discussions that I've had with my wife for talking to me. <laughs> God put her in my life for a reason. He put you guys in my life for a reason. He put me in your life for a reason. And together we can all declare who Jesus is. So as we talk about these things, as we think about these things, here's some questions. These are Nobody has to answer these. Just think about these. Are we redirecting somebody's life? So, are we helping others to know Jesus? And have we proudly and publicly declared who Jesus is? I think I mentioned this once before, but in my last class reunion, one of my classmates came up to me and he said, I really like what you post on social media, specifically. I'm not that brave. The, we're so used to getting ridiculed by others. He wasn't that brave. I don't see it as being that brave. I'm just putting it out there. I want others to see it. And, and I want other people to know I'm publicly declaring that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And who knows Jesus better because of the gospel lived out by you. Is your declaration of Jesus building the church or tearing it down? Remember we talked about Christians, they can be the worst, they can tear down the church pretty quickly. 
The scriptures tell us God doesn't need us to build up his church. We need to be doing it because of our love for him. Last question. Who do you declare each and every day through the things that you do in public and in private? See, it takes us right back to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10 tells us that our heart will be made right. And will you have challenges as you leave? Yeah. Will people push your buttons? Yeah. How do you respond? Show how you declare who Jesus is in your life. Father, thank you that you gave us Jesus to show us how to live our lives. That you gave us your love letter so we can know you. So we can know your son and so we can accept the Holy Spirit into our lives. Help us to be better, God. Help us to know who we are in you so that we can declare who you are each and every day and be a light in this dark world. I want to be in the light, as you are in the light. I want to shine like stars in the heavens. Oh, Lord, be our light, be our salvation. All I want is to be in the light. All I want is to be in the Thank you, God, for being here with us today, for being here in the room with us, and, and for opening our hearts and our minds to hear your word and accept our word into your hearts today. Thank you, Lord, for sending your spirit upon us and for anointing us with your presence. And as we come into this time of communion today, we think back to the cross, and we think about Jesus on the cross was a declaration, and a declaration was more than just the finality of an act. The declaration was, you are worthy. The declaration was, you are forgiven. The declaration was, you are redeemed. The declaration is, you don't have to succumb to the world, for I have overcome the world. So as we remember the sacrifice that Christ made, it was a declaration for us to follow him. He set an example for us by overcoming the world. We're to go into that world and help it be overcome. We are his hands and feet. We are his messengers to go out and bring that message, that good news to a broken world. And in doing so, as we take communion here, it's time for us to remember those acts and those things that Christ did for us. So as we do today, on the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, he took the cup and after he had blessed the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. It's a declaration of his sacrifice that he made for us. It is a declaration that he has overcome the world by his acts, that we are made worthy, that we are that we are redeemed by his acts. And it brings honor to him that we remember these things in our acts of communion today. The 
body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks. to remember today that we are in a world that is in great need of you. Lord, that we are in a world that is torn. And it's torn in so many ways, in so many directions, that it cannot be repaired by man alone. Lord, we need you today more than ever to come into our lives, to come into this world to make us your hands and feet, to go in and help save this world by your word, by your truth. Lord, help us to bring this to a broken society, to a broken world, to broken people. Lord, they need to hear this word, and if they don't hear it from us, who are they going to hear it from? Lord, put it on our hearts. Embolden us to go out. Enable us. Remove our fear. Help us to declare your works into this world. We pray these things in your precious and holy name today. Amen. So as we come into our time for our prayers with people, uh, we don't have uh, Denise in here with us today, so she and Steve are traveling, and we uh, wish them uh, safe travels on the way back today from visiting the, their family. And so, does anyone have any prayers that you would like to lift up? I have a declaration to make that God is good. He brought us through uh, a couple of weeks of, of real struggle, and uh, brought us back home safe, and Lori got to see what it was like traveling through these towns and, and through the traffic and things like that. So she got to learn firsthand and she was going, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so we're very, very thankful to be back and, and declare that God is good in all that he does. Um, Steve has surgery on Thursday. Steve, Steve, yeah. yep, Steve has surgery on Thursday, so we'd like to lift him up in prayer for that, that the procedure will go well and that he will come out healed in that process. We are very thankful to see Denny back in here with us today and that God has brought him through his procedure so far and that uh, he'll be with him and we'll be standing strong beside you as you go through your procedures yet to come. I think you're still going to have a couple of things done yet. <laughs> you got everything done? Oh, no. Got okay. All right. So you do. <laughs> wow. Got a lot accomplished when I was gone. Um, but we've got a lot of things to be very, very thankful for. And, and uh, we just need to understand, we need to look at these things as the blessings that God gives us. And it's answers to prayer. So it is a, by us being faithful and doing what God asks us to do that he answers our prayers. Because we come to him with earnest hearts. Uh, I got news yesterday that Brett... Uh, Beavers that we've been praying for, who has the terminal cancer, brain cancer, uh, had a procedure done Thursday at University Hospitals. So they removed a tumor from his brain. Uh, they got the operable one out, and uh, he did so well. They sent him home already, and so he's back uh, at home, kind of blessing, but he's back home already, which is awesome. Um, and so we pray for continued healing and recovery for him for his family, and uh, we want to really thank God that he does answer our prayers in, in these acts and mighty deeds that he does. Let's go to God in prayer today. Gracious Lord, you, you show yourself up. You declare your glory. You declare, Lord, that you are still on the throne by answered prayers, by being with us as we go into these procedures that may overwhelm us, but for you, Lord, you know exactly what your outcome is going to be. You know the healing that they need and you provide it. And we thank you, Lord God, for keeping 
us faithful, for keeping us uh, responsive to your requests, to your calls on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you enable us to go and do your works in this world. Lord God, we pray that we would be there for the people who are going through procedures this week, for those who are continue to recover, and for the answered prayers that you give us each and every day, Lord. Thank you for those blessings that you put upon us. Thank you for the opportunities, Lord, that we have coming up to serve our city, our community, Lord, to bring others into your word and to know you further each and every day. Thank you, Father God, and these things in your Son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, Pastor Terry, for a powerful message, powerful, convicting message for all of us. Um, so many things during your message hit me that I'm almost tired. Um, so you must be exhausted, Terry. <laughs> but uh, amen. And and you know, if if you're with us today, I thank you for being with us. If you're at home today, um, I hope that you could feel. Holy Spirit in your home like it has been here today. Um, and I want you to know that through all this time of COVID and trial, uh, that this is a warm and friendly place down here uh, in downtown Cedar Rapids. You wouldn't believe how warm and friendly you can feel in the middle of a shopping area, in the middle of a business district. Um, God is more than happy to send the advocate of his Holy Spirit here to be with us. And I, I invite you to be with us in person sometime. Uh, I think you'll uh, think you'll really get that feeling too. It's amazing. See? 
One of the promises we have is that if we are children of the Lord and and someday we go home to be with Him, uh, that uh, that there will be a place for us. And that's what the Rich Mullins talked about in this song. In my father's house, there are many, many rooms. In my father's house, there are many, many rooms. And I'm going up and down. Very good, so you live where I am, you may also eat. So if I go there, a place for you to move back in. If I go starting at verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let anyone who hears this say, Come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book. If anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the place described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and the, in the holy city that is described in this book. But listen to this. He who is the faithful witness to all these things. And say, he who declares, not just he, but they who, all of us, This is what Jesus says. Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Amen. Lord Jesus, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. May he be with you. May he be in everything that you declare, both in public and private, throughout the entirety of your day, each and every day. May he be filled with with peace, mercy, and forgiveness. And may you share those same things with everyone that you come into contact with. Go into each and every day knowing that God has prepared divine appointments for you. Father God, help us to meet those divine appointments and share your grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness with others. Let them see you through us, not the world. Let them experience the love that you have. And may we not
not get in the way of the gospel. Father, thank you for all that you do and everything that you teach us. In Jesus' name.